This is a British hover train. Yep, a British hover train exists and has done since 1970, though it might not do for much longer. It wasn't some billionaire's passion project, it was an infrastructure project backed by the government who pumped £130 million into it in today's money. So what happened? If we were one of the first, why won't the UK's new High Speed 2 be as fast as Japan's new maglev trains? Um, why have so few of us heard of it? Society's been obsessed with hovering transport since the mid-20th century. We can all picture that futuristic vision of cars flying through the sky and trains hovering along beams. In the 60s and 70s, people really tried to make this a reality with nuclear power, Concorde, and a few other wild visions of the future. This project was part of that, engineering the new world. And historically, the UK was pretty good with trains. We had the first steam trains, we were an early adopter of electric trains, and with high-speed rail on the horizon, the UK government didn't want to fall behind. So with the French developing the TGV, which is a conventional high-speed train, and the Japanese launching the bullet train, the British response was this, the tracked hovercraft. Developed by leading pioneers in engineering, it didn't run on wheels. Instead, it hovered on a cushion of air, eliminating friction. And while it was developed by a private company, most of the funding came from the government. The company set up a facility in Erith, Cambridgeshire, and picked a very straight and flat spot next to the old Bedford River to build the test track. They actually picked this because the land conditions were so bad that if they could make it work there, it'd work anywhere. A test vehicle was built at Vickers in Swindon, and a one-mile test track was completed in June 1970. After some troubleshooting, Research Test Vehicle 31, or RTV 31, did its first public test run on the 10th of December 1971, reaching a top speed of 15 miles per hour. Now, this isn't particularly speedy, but it was a remarkable feat of engineering. It worked by using high-powered fans to blow air, making it hover. To reach the crazy speeds they had in mind, they planned to combine this air levitation with magnetic levitation using a linear induction motor, or LIM. This would have provided both lift and also propulsion too. To get an idea of how it would have worked, imagine a train floating over a metal plate with magnets on either side pushing and pulling it along. There were no moving parts, just clever use of electricity and magnetism. It must have seemed incredibly futuristic. And it was. The goal was 250 miles per hour, faster than any train in Britain, even today, even faster than HS2's expected top speed. No shade. Now, when I was here checking it out for the first time, I kid you not, I bumped into a man who actually worked on the hover train. His name is Ted Tyndall, and he was known as Mechanical Systems Engineer. He told me a bit about his experience working on the project. Every test run, I was there recording all the facts like wind speeds and so on, what problems we encountered, what sort of speed we attained, and so on. It was reasonably quiet. The main noise, of course, uh, was the fans, the lift fans. Uh, and then, of course, once the power was turned off, it dropped onto the skids, which had the main stopping power. Additionally, at the end of the track, we had an aircraft arrest hook and instead of being inclined downwards, it stuck upwards. That stopped it all right. <laughs> he told me about how the train drew an incredible amount of power from the conductor rails on the track. In the archive footage, you can actually see sparks flying as the train moves. We run at far higher voltages than anybody had ever attempted on conductor rails before. Whereas, I think 1200 between Manchester and Bury was the maximum power through conductor rails, we were taking up to six and a half thousand volts. As time went by, work continued. They fitted more powerful motors, more track was built, and they discussed extending the test track to up to 18 miles. The speed increased too, eventually reaching more than 100 miles per hour in February 1973. But despite the project making progress, there were still a few big challenges. RTV 31 was a massive 22-ton vehicle about as heavy as two double-decker buses. That meant that making it hover was power-hungry, with massive amounts of power required to help the fans blast it off the track. And the big one? It couldn't actually carry passengers. At least, not yet. This was a test vehicle, and the windows have been painted on by Railworld, its current home. 
basically there was no facility for carrying passengers. And that, of course, is where the system fell down. Because if people couldn't take a ride on it, they weren't going to put their money to it, especially when the Minister of Transport visited. And uh, he, his first question was, can you ride on it? He was told no. And of course, that rather reflected on the proceedings. Just one week after setting its record speed, in what I'm sure will be a surprise to anyone who's even remotely clued up on British transport infrastructure, the government pulled the funding. This was a massive project. The hover train did work. It was just quite a long and expensive way of being an operational train line, requiring years more development and construction of a whole new route. Having invested the equivalent of £130 million into the project, the government cut its losses and decided it would be better to invest in the advanced passenger train, a conventional train that could tilt from side to side in order to speed round the corners of our existing Victorian tracks. Now that would do 125 miles an hour, but on conventional railway infrastructure, whereas this would have needed dedicated concrete beams, uh, so the government put their money that way, and that's yeah. where this effectively stopped. Without a major backer, over 100 people on the hover train project lost their jobs, and RTV 31 was unceremoniously abandoned at an airfield in Cranfield. Standing next to it now is massive. Even today, it feels like something out of science fiction, so why have so few of us heard of it? The hover train didn't have an easy afterlife. Staff who used to work on the project joined up with volunteers at Railworld in Peterborough to rescue RTV 31 in 1996. But as a relatively low profile relic, funding was hard to come by. Sat outside for 50 years, the structures deteriorated and there's word of it being dismantled altogether. These three concrete beams are all that's left of the test track, slowly being reclaimed by the Cambridgeshire countryside. It's a reminder of just how easy it is for us to forget the things that came before us. RTV 31 is too new to be considered particularly historic, but too old to be left out in the open. It was a test vehicle, it wasn't meant to stick around, and left outside, there's word that it might not survive much longer. The people at Railworlds told me that the beam it sits on might be structurally unstable and they might not be able to remove the hover train intact. Some are saying it might not survive the year. Many of the people who worked on the project are no longer around to tell the story, so it's up to a new generation to make sure the hover train isn't forgotten. Uh, we're looking at three lumps of concrete in the middle of nowhere that many people don't seem to know what they are. Well, from what I can gather, when the project was cancelled, uh, many of the staff became incredibly despondent, literally throwing things away. Paperwork, test material, you name it, it ended up in the skip. Um, somebody luckily had the presence of mind to kind of retrieve various things and, um, and it is forming an archive. The film material is more than 50 years old. Uh, they're having to be combined, spliced together, cleaned and then scanned in 4K and then the restoration can begin. So I really want to put together a documentary that tells the definitive story of the hover train in a way that's never been done before. So often reported that the project was a flop. It wasn't. These, these guys did succeed. The moment they start talking about this thing, you can hear the passion in their voice, you can see their eyes light up. It's, it's incredible. What was learned here helped further develop maglevs, trains that hover using magnetic levitation and LIMs instead of air. The LIM system was used to develop the old Airlink shuttle at Birmingham Airport in 1984, the air train at JFK Airport in New York, which is still there today, and most recently, the maglev trains being built in Japan, which got up to 375 miles per hour. It wasn't the last ambitious idea for the future of train travel. Projects like Hyperloop, which not only floats but does so through airtight tubes, are still being developed today. But the same issues still exist. They're complex, expensive and energy intensive. When we have a system that works, albeit slower, is it worth the investment? Well, with maglev taking off in countries like China and Japan, the answer for some is yes. And in all of these projects, the hover train's legacy quietly lives on. The future, not quite in reach, but tantalizingly close. This train never carried a single passenger. It never reached its full potential, but for a brief moment, it was the most ambitious transport project in Britain. And for now, you can come and see it. 
a train that hovers, or at least used to. Drew is doing fantastic work restoring the archives for a hover train documentary. If you're interested or want to support, there's a link below. Thank you to Manu for the amazing drone footage. I've linked his Instagram below if you want to connect. I've also linked a really informative piece which gives one of the best accounts available at the moment of the hover train. And thank you to Rail World in Peterborough. Everyone here has been so welcoming. It's a really impressive place. You should definitely come and check it out. When I had to look after the local press was one big challenge. Um, keeping them away from the live rails and so on, keeping them safe, whilst they wielded their camera tripods around. <laughs>